Welcome to the EW Podcast. I'm your host, Eric White. All right, so I'm very excited about today's episode. It is with Barbara Aerosmith Young, and we talk all about neuroplasticity. In this episode, Barbara and I discuss her inspiring story of overcoming her own learning difficulties and her work helping others through the Aerosmith program. To get us started, uh, here's a quick little bio on Barbara. Barbara Aerosmith Young is the founder of the Aerosmith program, an assessment process and a suite of cognitive exercises designed to stimulate and strengthen weak areas of cognitive functioning that underlie a range of learning difficulties. The program has been delivered for over 40 years throughout the world. Her work, begun in 1978, has been recognized as one of the first examples of the practical application of neuroplasticity, which, simply put, is the ability of the brain to change and rewire itself over one's lifetime. As the director of Aerosmith School and Aerosmith Program, she continues to develop and refine programs for students with learning difficulties. Her vision is that all students struggling with learning will have the opportunity to benefit from cognitive programs utilizing the principles of neuroplasticity, programs that change the brain's capacity to learn and open to these learners a world of possibilities. The genesis of the Aerosmith program's cognitive exercises lie in Barbara Aerosmith Young's journey of discovery and innovation to overcome her severe learning disabilities. Her inspirational book, The Woman Who Changed Her Brain, has become an international bestseller and a third edition updated with new research was published in December 2019. Barbara is the recipient of the 2019 Leaders and Legends Innovation Award from the Ontario Institute for Studies and Education at the University of Toronto for her outstanding contributions to education in Ontario. So, I hope you leave this episode as amazed by the possibilities of the brain as I was after speaking with her and first getting to read her book. Um, And kind of on a personal note, this episode represents a a direction that I would like to continue going with this podcast. Um, This conversation excites me to the core, and I just want to say a sincere thank you to Barbara for giving me the opportunity to interview her. So without further ado... Here is my conversation with Barbara Aerosmith Young. Okay, well, I'm here with Barbara Aerosmith Young. Thank you very much for joining me, Barbara. I appreciate you taking the time today. My pleasure. Um, So to kind of preface this, I first read about you in uh, Dr. Norman Deutsch's book, The Brain That Changes Itself and was very um, impressed and inspired by your story. So I was eager to, to get to talk to you. So I appreciate you responding to me and uh, giving me the chance to speak with you on your, on your amazing story. Thank you. Um, so let's just start this off. Um, can you describe your childhood and um, elaborate some of the learning disabilities you experienced um, up until you discovered the work of Luria? Sure. Um, Probably even before I started school, and this was a number of years ago, I was born in the early 1950s, um, there were there were some indications that something, you know, was a little off uh, with me, Um, you know, which later I discovered were specific, you know, parts of my brain that weren't doing what they were designed to do. So, you know, before schooling, um, you know, what my parents reported, I was very accident prone, clumsy, awkward. Uh, and later I understood that was a kinesthetic problem. I didn't register where uh, the left side of my body was in space. Um, so I would bump into things. Um, and, you know, I had some challenges with comprehension and understanding. So we'd need to have things uh, repeated different ways, multiple times to try to grasp, you know, what was being communicated, and I would get lost. Um, That was another area, like I couldn't construct uh, maps in my head. There was sort of no spatial relationships. So, yes, so even before I started school, there were were indications. But certainly when I started school, it became very clear uh, that something was not working properly. And in grade one, 
um, I was identified. And at that point, there wasn't a term learning disability or learning difficulty. It didn't exist. So I was identified in grade one as having a mental block. And being quite literal, I actually thought I had a piece of wood, like, you know, a a children's block, a wooden cube in my head that made learning difficult. Then later I came to learn, no, I didn't have a piece of wood in my head, but I had blockages or parts of my brain that weren't working efficiently to um, do certain things. So in grade one, I overheard my teacher tell my mother Uh, not to have high expectations for me, that all of my learning was going to be a a struggle and that, um, you know, that I wasn't really going to amount to much. And, you know, that was quite uh, devastating (laughs) to hear uh, as a child. And I, I felt in some sense that I got a life sentence in grade one, you know, a sentence to a life of, of, um, struggle. And there wasn't, um, as I said, there wasn't really a lot of understanding about uh, learning difficulties. So my mother had been a teacher and she decided that her daughter was going to learn how to read and was going to learn how to write and was going to learn how to do basic um, math because those were areas that I struggled in. I wrote everything uh, backwards. I struggled to read. Numbers didn't mean anything to me. So if you gave me 12 and 14, I might add the four and then the two and then the one. Um, like it was just sort of a random series of, of uh, events in, in my world. So the school that I went to, the elementary school, was right across the street from my house. And so I would come home at lunch and my mother would give me flashcards with letters and numbers. I would come home after school and I would get flashcards. And so I'm, I'm, you know, I didn't really appreciate it at the time, but I'm eternally grateful to my mother because without her, you know, determination and her putting in all that work, I wouldn't have learned probably how to read very effectively or to write or to do, um, do numbers. So I, I did, but it didn't address the underlying learning difficulty. It just sort of um, addressed some of the symptoms of, of the challenge or the problem. And it allowed me you know, to continue on in, in my schooling. But my grade one teacher was right in the sense that all of my schooling was challenging and was a struggle. You know, there wasn't a day that I can remember that um, I was excited about learning or that there was any joy in learning. Everything was a struggle. And I, I joke that I became a workaholic in grade one. But for me, it took what I call heroic effort, and this is not unusual for individuals with learning difficulties, that it takes them 10, 20, 30, 40 times the amount of effort to do what individuals without learning difficulties can just do sort of naturally, um, because they have the cognitive capacities to to do that kind of learning. Um, So, you know, being very determined, I put in that kind of effort, and I, you know, I got through... um, elementary school, I mean, not without a lot of struggle and and despair. And in uh, grade eight, the summer, that's when in my schooling at that time, the next year was grade nine, which was high school. And I couldn't imagine, like with all the struggles that I had in elementary school, how I was going to handle high school. Now with, you know, multiple teachers and and having to find my locker because I would get lost all the time. And feeling incredible despair, I, I attempted to end my life, um, you know, because I just, I just didn't see a future for myself. And, you know, because of the nature of the learning difficulty that I had, I didn't really understand how you went about doing that, which was a blessing. Um, so I woke up the next morning and obviously I'm still here and I am grateful for that. Um, but it, it was that kind of despair that led to, you know, feeling that, I didn't fit in. There was no place for me. So waking up that next morning, I thought, okay, well, I'm here. So I just have to keep working really hard and soldier on. And, and um, you know, and, and that was really pretty much most of my schooling. You know, I would be what now the term is gifted, uh, learning disabled, where, you know, I had some exceptional abilities, uh, so some exceptional strengths, but also some exceptional uh, difficulties. And the areas that I struggled with, uh, the idea of um, 
uh, reasoning or seeing connections between things, understanding meaning. So if somebody spoke to me, I mean, if they said it's raining out, I could understand that because that's very concrete. I could conjure up an image or a picture of what rain looked like. But if it got abstract at all, if I had to make connections or see relationships between things, um, you know, if there were any ideas, I couldn't make those connections. So I would um, memorize what the person was saying because I had a really strong, almost a verbatim auditory memory. And I would walk away. And for the next couple of hours, I would play that conversation over and over and over again, trying to understand what they meant by what they said. And sometimes I would figure it out, not always, but even if I did figure it out, that person had left. They hadn't waited for me to figure it out. So mm -hmm. I wasn't part of, you know, human discourse. Um, I had this image in my head, you know, of myself with my face pressed against a plate glass window. And on the other side of that window, there was a banquet going on. Like there were people interacting and laughing and um, having a really good time. And I can just remember my face pressed against the glass, wanting to be part of, of all of that human interaction and not being able to do it. You know, another image I had growing up was living in a fog where there was this sort of fog all around me that made um, everything confusing. And I, I felt like if I did grasp or understand something, it was really tenuous and it would just disappear into a mist. So it was this, this idea of, you know, working really, really hard to understand my world, but never really feeling confident that I had. And another image I had was sort of that the ground would always be shifting under my feet. I think I came to an understanding, but then realizing, no, I wasn't quite right. And then it would shift again. So living in a world of incredible anxiety, you know, struggled with feelings of, of depression, uh, low self-esteem. Uh, and then there's this concept of imposter phenomenon where I felt that, you know, because I could do well, I mean, at times I could get 80 or 90% because again, I would use my auditory memory. I'd memorize things or I had a, a photographic visual memory. So I would memorize all my notebooks. And when I came to an exam, I would look at the question hope I understood it. And then I would flip through either my verbatim auditory memory or visual memory to try to make a match, find the answer and put it down on paper. And sometimes I did a really good match. So I might get 80 or 90%. And sometimes I did a really bad match and I'd get you know, 10 or 20%. Um, and my teachers would conclude that you know, I hadn't worked hard for that 20%. Well, I worked equally hard for the 20% as the you know, 90%, but I just, didn't understand the question, so I made a bad match. But I would worry that with this imposter phenomena, that if if people looked really closely, they would see that I was a fraud. That that really um, I didn't really understand things. You know, I just was was mimicking, um, you know, what what I had heard or seen, and there was no substance uh, to myself mm -hmm. or you know. To anything about me, so it, it you know wasn't really a very pleasant reality um, growing up. And you know I had parents that cared about me very deeply and wanted the best for me, but they certainly didn't understand um, my struggles because again at that time there wasn't much understanding. Um, and you know I wanted to hide from them also the degree of the struggle and. You know, when I, I wrote my book, The Woman Who Changed Her Brain, I interviewed a lot of um, people with learning difficulties. And one of the things we all talked about was this, what we call the pact of silence, that, that in a sense, there's a shame around having a learning difficulty or a learning disability. And so we keep silent about it. We want to hide it. We want to feel like we can learn like everybody else. And we don't want to burden our families or um, let them know, you know, how much pain we are actually experiencing and how much of a struggle. So um, I certainly, you know, experienced that growing, going through school. And, you know, I managed because I did have some strengths to get into uh, undergraduate and did a degree in uh, child studies. And I think, you know, partly my um, 
doing that degree was really trying to find a solution to not really a solution to my difficulties, but trying to understand, you know, in child development, you're looking at how a child develops, you know, in all sorts of different ways and cognitively is one of them, but trying to understand, you know, what is normal development and what was wrong with me. And then I went on to do a master's degree in school psychology, which is where you um, start to assess learning difficulties. So, you know, kind of my whole schooling was really a quest to, you know, try to understand myself and was there anything I could do about that. And I was also very lucky in my father. He was a, an inventor, a, a scientist, and had a number of patents. And from him, I sort of caught that creative process, the, you know, trying to hunt for a solution. And he said to me early on, he said, if there, there's a problem and there's no solution currently in the world, he said, it's, it's your responsibility to go out and find a solution. So I feel very early, I was set on a quest to try to find a solution to my difficulties. And he said another um, thing that, you know, I've held dear to me, he said that if the rest of the world tells you you can't do this, he said, don't listen. He said, this is how science goes forward. And certainly, you know, when I did start my work, um, it was in the time of what I call the pre-neuroplastic paradigm. And a lot of people said, this isn't possible. The brain is fixed. So, you know, why are you trying to see if you can actually change it? And mm -hmm. I remembered what my father said, you know, don't be limited by conventional wisdom, go out and, and try and you might fail, but, but try. So um, sort of in a long winded way, <laughs> that was, <laughs> was my, my schooling experience. So my grade one teacher was right in that all of my education was, you know, uh, an incredible struggle and challenge. But I think she was wrong in that when she said that not to have high expectations and that I wasn't going to amount to much. At least I, I hope she was <laughs> incorrect in that. So uh, I hope that answered that question. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think it's extremely interesting when I was reading your book, The Woman that, Who Changed Her Brain, um, that you were kind of set up to eventually create this program. As you said, your father was an inventor, your mother was an educator. Um, so it's almost like you were on this trajectory from, from the very beginning to eventually go on to create this program that would help people with their learning disabilities. So I find that extremely interesting. Um, and another thing that... I've read in your book um, from some of your interviews with other um, individuals who had learning disabilities is that it can cause a lot of turmoil in the home, a lot of misunderstanding between parents and children. Um, was that your experience at all with your family or were they um, mostly empathetic with you and uh, patient? I think, um, again, like to set it into sort of the historical context, there wasn't a lot of talking about it, you know, in my growing up, because it was almost a, a unknown, unexplored phenomena, learning difficulty. And I like the term, in the Southern Hemisphere, they use the term learning difficulty. We learn, mm -hmm. use the term in the Northern Hemisphere, learning disability. I like to call it a learning difficulty. So whenever I refer to learning difficulty, it's what we call a learning disability. Because to me, I don't like disability, but it is a difficulty. I mean, some people call it a learning difference. Uh, and yes, it is a difference, but it is also a difficulty because it causes challenges. But for me, um, I think, you know, my experience was, I mean, my parents, I, I knew, you know, they cared about me and they supported me, but there wasn't a context to have the conversation within, which there is now, because we have much more understanding. There's a lot more research on, on learning difficulties. Um, so I just felt, you know, I just have to work harder, you know, that, mm. like, and there was an expectation, certainly in my family, um, that all of us were going to go to university. It just was a given. Um, so I just knew I, you know, that took extra work. I just had, had to do it. Um, but certainly what, um, you know, with more understanding and, and awareness here um, now, I mean, and even with that, it still, it does cause turmoil. I mean, I think one of the things, if we can understand and look at behavior through a cognitive lens, um, which is kind of looking at behavior through uh, the complexity of each unique human being. I mean, and that's in my book, I, each chapter is on a different kind of cognitive area or cognitive function. And how that plays out, if there's a strength in that area or if there's an area of, of difficulty, and then how that individual 
perceives his or her world. And um, and certainly what I find is, you know, once if somebody comes into our work and we do our, our assessment, which looks at the strengths and weaknesses in 19 different cognitive areas, the individual themselves and the family get tremendous insight and recognize, okay, in this area, this is why, you know, Joey is behaving this way because this is how they actually see the world. It's not that, you know, he's mm. being difficult or obstreperous or trying to avoid certain things. It's, you know, either this is really difficult for him or he sees things differently. You know, if the individual can't read nonverbal cues, um, you know, which is is uh, what I call, you know, nonverbal thinking, then they're going to struggle. They're going to misinterpret social uh, interactions. They're maybe going to think their parent is angry with them when they aren't um, because they can't accurately interpret. And when a parent understands that, then they can find other ways um, to communicate with their child and help them, um, you know, understand their world or have different expectations that not to expect um, certain behavior. I mean, if somebody has one of the auditory memories that, um, that we can identify and address where they can't hold a um, significant amount of information, you know, for some students, if you give them more than two instructions at a time, they're going to walk away and only remember one of those. So they're going to maybe appear lazy or stubborn because you've asked them to do something and they don't complete it. They don't finish it. Um, and that can be with adults as well, where a boss asks one of their employees to do something and the person doesn't complete it. I mean, there are multiple reasons for why somebody might not complete something, but one of them could be they just can't hold that amount of auditory information. I worked with a, a, a pilot once who couldn't uh, hold, you know, auditory instructions. So it meant that he couldn't hold all the information, you know, from the air traffic controller. And he had a strategy. He would get the air traffic controller to repeat the instructions multiple times. But my worry was, what if you're flying into it like a really um, busy airport and the air traffic controller can't repeat things multiple times? And uh, obviously, in the case of this individual, we worked on that function, we strengthened it so the pilot now can hold the information. But I think sometimes what we call human error might be what I call a cognitive mismatch, where there's a cognitive function that isn't um, strong enough to meet the demands of whatever that that job is. Um, you know, so back to you know the turmoil in in families, what we see is the first level is understanding. So if you really understand, you know, um, you know, the cognitive profile of the individual and their strengths and areas of difficulty, uh, you can start to have compassion and much more insight and understanding into their behavior. And then the next step is, you know, with this concept of neuroplasticity, we know that, um, you know, it isn't fixed, right? So if there is a, a difficulty in an area, we can actually enhance and strengthen functioning in that area. So we bring it um, up to uh, average in functioning. So it's it's no longer causing that, that difficulty or that um, barrier in terms of being able to understand certain things or hold certain information or um, behave in certain ways. Um, but you know, when we talk about a learning difficulty, it, it impacts the child and hugely impacts the family. And that's what we see as, um, you know, uh, students go through this work is not only do they change, but the whole family dynamic changes. Um, in your... 20s, you were introduced to the work of Alexander Luria, the Russian psychologist, um, and his patient Lev Zizetsky, um, who had similar um, difficulties that you were experiencing. His obviously were um, attributed to a bullet wound, whereas yours were uh, with you from birth. Why, why was this discovery significant for you, and how did this kind of set up the work you would eventually do? Well, the, the first um, step in trying to solve a problem is you have to really deeply understand the nature of the problem that you're trying to solve. So for me, Luria's work 
helped me understand the nature of my problem or my difficulty. Um, I, I certainly knew, you know, from very early on that I did not learn like other people did, uh, and that everything took me, uh, you know, so much longer to do. You know, I read an article that was five pages. I might have to read it 50 times before thinking that I understood what it what it said. So, um, so I always knew there were, was something not right, but I didn't know exactly what it was. So Luria was where the aha moment came in the book, The Man with the Shattered World, which, as you said, is the story of uh, uh, Leova Zizetsky, the Russian soldier uh, that in World War II had a very localized uh, head injury as a result of uh, an injury in a battle. And as I read this book, it was um, Zazetsky's journal describing the things that that he could no longer do that he'd been able to do before the wound. And then it was Luria, who was the brilliant Russian neuropsychologist, describing what was happening in Zazetsky's brain uh, that was leading to these difficulties and challenges. And as I read Zazetsky's journal, um, it was like, you know, he was living my life and I was living his life. It was the first time where, um, as he was describing his challenges in his journal, I was using the same language in my journal, you know, half a world away and several decades later. We both talked about um, how meaning was ephemeral and it would just disappear into a mist. You know, by the time somebody got to the end of the sentence, it wasn't a memory issue, but you, you couldn't really connected in meaning to the beginning of the sentence, um, but things moved too quickly to be able to grasp them. Before the injury, he'd been uh, studying mathematics. After the injury, he couldn't understand fractions. I had never been able to understand fractions because they're relationships. I could understand one because I could you know, see one object. I could understand four because I could line up four objects, again, very concrete. But as soon as you put the one over top of a four, it's a relationship of a part to a whole that meant nothing to me. And after his injury, it meant nothing to Zazetsky. He couldn't read uh, an analog clock, which he could before the injury. I was, I think, 25 or 26 at this time. I still couldn't read an analog clock. I'd never been able to read an analog clock, uh, no matter how hard I tried. Um, because it, you know, to read a clock, you have to understand the relationship between the hour hand and the minute hand. Like it's a relational concept. Um, the, the things like uh, concepts like greater than, less than, bigger than, smaller than, all of these things he was describing, I struggled with. So now I knew that something in my brain wasn't working properly because that was the source of his problem. It must be the source of my problem. And I knew, you know, I didn't have a piece of wood in my head. I knew I didn't have a bullet in my brain. Um, but for whatever reason, that part of my brain wasn't working the way it should be working. So that was my first uh, insight to where was the source of my problem was my brain. And then I started reading other books by Luria, um, The Working Brain, uh, Higher Cortical Functions in Man, uh, Traumatic Aphasia, and then Problems in Neurolinguistics. And remember, I had trouble with comprehension at this point. So I would like read these pages over and over and over again. And if you look at any of my books, like I, I was using different colored highlighters, I was drawing diagrams. So I was using all the compensations that I had learned um, through my schooling to try to support my understanding. But there was something in his writing and the way he wrote that, and I think it was because it was a vector to my challenges that um, I stuck with it until I understood it. And he had this one sentence in um, Problems in Neurolinguistics where he talked about somebody with this difficulty that Zeski had and that I have can never verify meaning, that the person walks around in a constant state of uncertainty. And it was like, um, I just took a deep, sigh of relief when I read that because that mm. was my experience. I, I, I walked around in this fog, this sense of uncertainty, this unknowing, um, you know, this confusion, anxiety because of, of the learning difficulty. So here's the problem. Now, Luria never talked about really neuroplasticity. He never talked about, um, you know, 
other than workarounds or compensations, what could you do if there was a difficulty here? And obviously he was dealing with people with traumatic injury. So what was the next piece? So I, I knew what the problem was, but what do I do about it? And the next piece came in the work of Mark Rosenschwag, who was a psychologist at Berkeley in California. And in the 60s was doing a lot of work with rats um, and looking at this idea of neuroplasticity, which really means that, you know, that our brain isn't fixed, that, that through um, stimulation, through experience, through activity, uh, we can, you know, change um, neural connections, we can increase neurotransmitters, we can fundamentally change our brain physiologically and functionally, which can lead to um, improved learning. And what he saw with rats was if, you know, you put rats in a very enriched environment, lots of stimulation uh, compared to rats in a just normal environment or rats in what he called an impoverished environment where there was very little stimulation. And then he would put the three groups through mazes, which is like a little intelligence test for rats. And the group with all the enrichment learned um, more efficiently, more quickly their way through the mazes. And then after the experiment, he looked into their brains. And what he found was the rats with all the enrichment and stimulation, their brains had changed um, physiologically and functionally. Uh, they had more uh, uh, dendrites, so more branches on the neurons, which allow for more synaptic connections, so better neurotransmission. They had more neurotransmitters, more glia cells, and large capillaries. So multiple ways these brains had changed physiologically, which he concluded was a result of the stimulation, and they were better at learning mazes. So he argued, um, you know, called activity-dependent plasticity, right? So the activity drove the, the neuroplastic changes uh, in the brain of these animals, which led to better learning. And then he did a really interesting experiment, at least I thought it was interesting, where he blindfolded a group of rats. And what he found with those rats with the increased stimulation is a very specific part of the brain change, the somatosensory cortex, which is important for, you know, tactile kind of kinesthetic experience. And one sentence in that article, he said, differential stimulation leads the differential effect. And for me, that's what I needed because um, I didn't need broad stimulation. I needed differential targeted stimulation to the specific difficulty I had with the idea that maybe I could change that part of my brain. And I felt at that time, if rats have neuroplasticity, surely humans must have neuroplasticity. It just kind of made sense to me. Mm -hmm. um, and pretty much everybody I spoke to at that point um, told me that wasn't the case, like, you know, that basically your brain is fixed in childhood, but I was pretty desperate. Um, and I thought, what do I have to lose but time if I set up an experiment for myself and I couldn't tell time. So I figured, you know, let's, let's, let's try this. And then I thought, okay, what, what is that differential stimulation for me? Um, and thinking about Luria's work and this, you know, understanding that somebody with the difficulty I had or Zazetsky had couldn't tell time, I thought maybe I use time to force my brain to process relationships. And I had no idea if it would work, um, but I set out to create a whole exercise with clocks, like clock faces, analog clock faces. Um, and I was pretty abysmal at it because I couldn't tell time, so I had to have a friend help me. Um, but over time, doing this, you know, hundreds of thousands of repetitions, because I was determined, um, you know, I got faster and more accurate at being able to draw or read a two-handed clock, um, which I hadn't been able to do before. And that was great. Now I could look at a clock and I could read it, but I didn't feel any change in my ability yet to understand the world. So I thought this idea of a cognitive complexity, I had to make the task more difficult. So I added another hand. Um, and now this is, you know, hours, minutes, seconds. And, and I worked through the, the 
exercise, again, multiple, multiple hours until I could do it really quickly and really accurately. And that was great. Um, but wasn't feeling cognitive change. And so I added a fourth hand and that was like a fraction of a second. And it was after I mastered that level of processing four relationships simultaneously, accurately and quickly that my world changed and I knew there was human neuroplasticity. And so the intention of the activity wasn't to be able to tell time, but it was really to find a way to force my brain to engage in the activity that was a challenge for it. And after mastering that level of the activity, I could listen to conversations. And for the first time in my life, I could understand people as they were talking to me. I didn't have to memorize them and walk away and play it over. I became part of human discourse for the first time because I could understand, I could say something appropriate back to them. I could understand what they said back to me. I actually could have uh, an ongoing dialogue with somebody. I could now look at a book, I could read a page and I could understand it in the first reading and then I could read the next page and connect it. Um, I went back and taught myself all of mathematics. I could understand fractions. It, it was really, really profound. So I knew there was human neuroplasticity. The thing that changed that really surprised me was um, I have, you know, very strong uh, visual photographic memory for um, the nonverbal world as well. So every night as I was sort of drifting off to sleep, I would play scenes through in my mind's eye uh, from age four and age five that I'd never understood and think, oh my gosh, that's why this person did X, whatever X was, or that's why this happened. And it really felt like that fragmented sense of myself and my psyche started to integrate into a coherent whole. Um, it, it was incredibly profound. And, you know, to be able to not only understand mathematics, but understand human relations um, was, was um, transformative. So that was, yeah, that, that was, so I dedicated my book to um, Luria because really without his work, and there's this concept of standing on the shoulder of giants, um, you know, to understand things and, and move science forward. I am eternally grateful uh, for the work he, he did because I couldn't have done my work without that and the work of Mark Rosenschweig as well. It's amazing to me that uh, you mentioned you had difficulty understanding the relationship of a one uh, over a number four in a fraction, um, but somehow you were able to kind of take these two separate works from Luria and from Rosenschwag and make the relationship into something actionable for yourself. Was that just a matter of committing these things to memory and a lot of hard work to finally make those connections? How did how did you uh, come across that relationship and understand it to the point where you were able to use the information to better yourself? Yeah, I, I think it was probably was a different way of knowing um, and because it was so personal. Like, and, and there was something about the way Luria wrote. And I think if, if he hadn't, if the Man with the Shattered World hadn't had Zazetsky's journal in it, I don't know that I would have um, made the connection because it was really... It started with Zazetsky's journal, which was very experiential. And and as I said, my I was writing exactly, you know, the same content in my journal. So there was a, um, a very experiential content or, or connection that wasn't a rational, reasoned connection. It was really more an emotional kind of gut sense, like this is my experience. Um, so I think that was what made it possible for me. And, and then I did, I read, as I said, like, I, I mean, I, I don't know how many um, thousands of hours I poured over Luria's books and, uh, you know, with different colored highlighters and, and, and I used to use um, kind of my right hemisphere, like, so I would draw diagrams to try to understand language concepts. So, you know, I, I drove diagrams and, and so, um, 
yeah, the books are a bit of a mess, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, but but it, it was because I felt like I was fighting for my life at that point. Um, I think I'd mentioned that, you know, I had attempted to end my life in grade eight. Well, I was now, I think maybe, I can't remember, 25 or 26 at this time. And I'd made the decision that I, there was no future for myself. And, and I was going to, I was contemplating ending my life again. Um, because I, everything was so much of a struggle, I didn't imagine that anybody would ever hire me. Like, you know, what kind of work could I do? Because I couldn't understand what people were asking me to do. And nobody, again, in, in a job situation was going to give me, like, you know, five times more time to figure things out. So it 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 was, um, yeah, it was like a, it was like a lifeline was thrown down to me. And so I was going to fight as, as, you know, it was kind of the fight of my life, <laughs> you know, <laughs> to try to understand this and see if I could um, change my future. And, and I always had my father there in the back of my head, you know, with that, you know, message about, you know, um, trying to find a solution and, uh, you know, and and again, you know, he would come home when I was a child with all his diagrams and blueprints and lay them out on the living room floor. And I didn't really understand anything of what he was explaining, but kind of that excitement of the creative process and, and you know, hypothesizing and trying different things. So I just thought, I have to try this again with no... Um, no expectation necessarily that it, that it would work, but I had to try. So that's, um, you know, what led me to, you know, to the breakthrough that, that, uh, you know, that created this, this work. Um, one of the things that really resonated with me while reading your book was just how miraculous it is that anyone has a functioning brain that works perfectly. Um, just when you consider all of the different processes that happen for me to be told to do something, to go do it, all the motor um, and memory functioning that needs to go right in the brain and all the different regions with their own specializations. Um, from your experience, is it likely that most people have defects or weaknesses, or sorry, not defects, difficulties mm-hmm. or weaknesses in one area or another? Yes. I mean, it, I haven't met anybody yet that has, uh, and they might be out there, that, that has, you know, because of the complexity of the human brain that has everything, you know, working at an optimal level. And I mean, we could just look at ourselves, like people that don't have learning difficulties. We all, like everybody avoids certain things. Like, you know, people talk about, you know, oh, I'm just not good at um, that, right? Whatever that might be. I mean, it might be, you know, I'm just not good at remembering things if I hear them, but I'm good at remembering them if I see them. Um, You know, oh, I get lost. You know, I'm not really good at navigating or I just, you know, I'm not good at remembering people's faces or I'm not good at remembering names. Um, So everybody can relate, or I'm not good at languages. You know, some people Mm -hmm. Uh, with broken speech pronunciation, struggle with the oral aspect of, of uh, learning a language. So anybody, if they're looking at themselves honestly, will probably recognize something that doesn't come easily and that, you know, they they just either avoid or don't really spend a lot of time um, in that area or they get somebody else to help them, you know. So if you're not good at navigating, you travel with somebody that is good at navigating. Um, and... Though when somebody has a learning difficulty, it's where there's what I call a cognitive load. There's kind of a pileup of, you know, areas of difficulty that um, make it hard just to avoid because they're they're a significant number that are interfering with the learning process across a, a broad range of, of um, areas. But yeah, every, everybody, you know, has has difficulties, and it, it really. Um, depends too, you know, this idea that I talked earlier about the cognitive mismatch, where, you know, in certain aspects of, of one's life and career, maybe, you know, an area of difficulty doesn't really matter because it doesn't play into what you're you're doing professionally. But in others, it does, like, you know, the pilot that couldn't remember the information, or I had a um, 
somebody that was doing their residency in pathology at a teaching hospital and had to uh, was examining um, a slide with with breast tissue, somebody that had, had breast cancer and had gone through treatment and was now to determine are they in remission. And, uh, you know, the, the um, resident knew how important this was. He was really diligent and careful and was just about to sign off that the person was in remission when, you know, his supervisor came over and said, well, didn't you see this here? This is actually cancer. And it wasn't that he hadn't seen it, but his brain hadn't recognized it. Mm -hmm. um, and he exited out his program. He worked on that function because we have a program for that. And he won't make that kind of mistake again. So it, it really depends on, you know, where an area of difficulty is and, and what it is that you're doing in your life in terms of will it have a, an impact. Um, but it, it will always have some kind of impact, whether it's just something you avoid or it can have a more significant impact because it's a critical capacity in, you know, what you're doing professionally. Hmm. In the book, um, there are several instances, including yourself, where a certain difficulty um, also is uh, coexisting with a certain proficiency. Um, for you, it was your memory was above average. Is this usually the case where if someone has a, a certain difficulty that's severe, that they have a proficiency in another area? It, it, it's, it, uh I say it happens at times, but not always. I mean, it, it's again, it's the, the you know kind of the majesty of the human brain is complexity and and variability, right? So definitely, we you know the thousands and thousands of students that we've worked with um, from you know age five up to eighty one. That's the oldest individual I've worked with. So I don't know if you call them a student, but I mean, and just the word I use. Um, is that you know in some cases yes they they've got some exceptional strengths and and possibly like in my case i think i was born with strengths in certain areas but because i i overutilized them to compensate for my difficulties i probably even uh, enhanced them and made them mm. stronger uh, and and we we definitely see that in students and then sometimes you just see individuals that um you know, their areas of, of difficulty and the other things are, are sort of more average and they're helping them compensate to some extent, but it's harder because they, they aren't um, significantly strong enough to really allow them um, to, you know, fully and effectively compensate. So it, it just really, really depends. But no matter where the individual is, like I, I think of these functions on a continuum, like so... Mm you know, points to the complexity, you know, the continuum can be like in an area you can be gifted, you know, so have exceptional ability, you can have average ability, you can have a mild, moderate or severe level of difficulty in one area. And then in another area, um, you might, you know, be on the opposite end of the spectrum from the previous area. So it's just it's those combinations of permutations that make up our unique cognitive functioning. And I think the thing, as humans, we often assume that everybody functions the way we do, and that's not the case. And that's why I think this idea of looking at behavior through a cognitive lens, if we can understand that the way I see the world might be different than the way you see the world because of our unique cognitive makeup. And if we can get, um, somebody recently said this concept of respectful curiosity, which I told mm. her I was going to steal from her because yeah. I love it. So if we, we get respectfully curious about, you know, how someone else is functioning, um, we can, you know, have compassionate insight into their world and, you know, not attribute, you know, negative maybe personality characteristics like just being difficult or, or non-compliant, but understand that that behavior is because of how they um, they they see the world and I, I just really think um, that's where we need to, to start from is this respectful curiosity and understanding each of our own unique um, makeup and you know I learn more all the time like I'm I'm humbled by this work um, and will never hopefully stop learning as I you know I just was on tour in the U.S. and uh, New Zealand and Australia before this whole uh, 
uh, COVID-19 situation happened mm -hmm. and I had to cut the tour short and come back. But like every time I meet, you know, students around the world and talk to them about, you know, who they are in the world and how they see the world, I, I learn more um, and come home and actually put, you know, refinements and developments into the program that I've developed from my learnings out in the field. So um, I, I'm just, you know, uh, always amazed and humbled by the complexity and the individual variability in in our our unique cognitive makeup and and try as much as possible not to make uh, assumptions about you know what's driving certain behavior uh, and to try to have this respectful um, curiosity but you know we all have our own unique um, profiles and part of what I had hoped when I wrote my book was that you know, if people could understand these, um, maybe they could have insight into their own functioning and the functioning of, you know, of other people and start from that, that place of, of insight and compassion. Yeah, absolutely. I, uh, reading your book, I definitely recognized some weaknesses in myself and also, um, by the end felt I had a greater sense of empathy for other people. And, you know, there's a lot of things in your book that you talk about where you don't, if you have a brain that, you know, functions at an average level or above average, you don't really think of these things as processes in themselves. But whenever you kind of see the someone with a difficulty in that area, it gives you a greater sense of empathy and understanding. Yes. I mean, I think that's to me, that's a starting point. And then the next point is, you know, if we understand that we can start from where the individual is and we can move them up that continuum. So, you know, if, if in an area the person's starting at a moderate level of difficulty in the function, we can move that up ideally to average. And in some cases we can bring it to above average, uh, you know, and, um, and, you know, to me, we've, we've done this with, you know, thousands of, of students where the program is in a 90 schools you know, around the world. And my goal is to make this work um, more accessible and certainly, uh, you know, again, in the world that we're uh, functioning in right now with, you know, schools having closed around the world, we've shifted and adapted our program. So it's now being uh, delivered in virtual classrooms online. Uh, and these students are still able, even though they can't physically go to school, are still able to access the program, which is going to um, remove kind of the geographic barrier from being able to, to um, you know, do this cognitive change and cognitive transformation. So I'm, I'm, it's you know, trying to look at the opportunities and the silver lining in, in a you know, very challenging and and uh, difficult time that we're experiencing with uh, you know the isolation that's having to happen with with COVID nineteen. But my fundamental goal is to make this work accessible, you know, to every individual in the world that is struggling with learning. Um, you know, what a lot of these students talk to me about is that they don't dare to dream. At a certain point, they they stopped dreaming of a, a you know, positive future for themselves. And I certainly know I did that for myself. Um, and I think what this work does is it not only allows these students now to start dreaming again because they now have uh, you know transformed cognitive abilities but they now have the cognitive wherewithal and the cognitive strengths to not only dare to dream but to actually realize their dreams and a lot of the adults that i work with talk about you know how they often feel their career was chosen for them they said by the time they got to that Point, they said so many doors were closed because of their difficulties and only maybe one or two doors uh, were open so their choices were limited and again what I think this work does is it it opens multiple doors and possibilities and the person may still choose to walk through that same door but now it's a choice and they have options mm -hmm. um, we've had a lot of adults that have totally shifted careers you know um, because you know they after they have the, the you know the cognitive capacities shift and change, um, there are other doors open, and so they go back to school and go in a totally different direction. You know, in the new version that's just updated in December of this year of my book, 
And there are a number of new case studies. And, you know, there's one of, uh, you know, a lawyer that's now become a, a naturopath and uh, a lawyer that's now become a very successful visual artist. Uh, you know, so it, it you know, it, it allows, it kind of frees up um, human potential, I guess. It, it, you know, I like this idea of freeing energy to dance with the universe. Mm -hmm. um, and I think essentially that's what, this work does because if you have an area of learning difficulty, it it um, takes energy from the system, right? Because you're you're having to spend extra effort and work to work around or compensate for the difficulty, and that extra energy and work um, isn't available, you know, for other processes. You know, we've had mm. uh, people that have you know, when they start the work, who are creative, worry, oh, is this going to, or have a strength, is this going to rob from that strength to go somewhere else? And actually, at the end of the program, what they experience is, no, they, that, you know, taking that area of difficulty, transforming it into strength, then that strength gets used with the other strengths and, and allows them to be even more creative, you know, um, you know, we, we've got multiple, multiple examples of, you know, singers, songwriters, jazz pianists. Um, there's a, you know, very successful visual, another visual artist I was just speaking to this morning. Um, you know, and they, they, because the energy isn't having going to go into compensating for an area of difficulty, it's now available for the creative process. So, mm -hmm. um, huge application, I believe, uh, for this work. And we're now working with an organization on the west coast of Canada in Vancouver called ABI Wellness um, that has taken some of my programs and are working with people with uh, traumatic or acquired brain injury and seeing similar results to what we're seeing with individuals with, with learning difficulties. Um, this, you know, cognitive transformation, as long as there's, you know, healthy functioning still left in an area, we can enhance that, that function. So, um, you know, I think, you know, huge implications and applications uh, to, you know, transform what is a struggle in learning or processing or understanding into um, into a strength, and uh, you know, I'm just I'm always humbled. And the favorite, my favorite part of my work is, you know, when I get to go out on the road and meet students at all ages uh, that are currently in the program or have been through the program, and um, you know, and and to hear their stories, and and that's um, why. You know, I, I do this work is I know when I saw the transformation for myself, I thought I have to take this work out into the world um, to help others that are also struggling. And, you know, as I did that, this work evolved because not everybody had the same problems that I had. Right. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, I, some students did, but a lot of students had very different learning difficulties. And uh, for me, it was you know, meeting these individuals, deeply listening to they as they described their problems, really trying to understand them, going back into Luria's work, trying to understand from his descriptions, you know, what that might be in terms of, you know, the brain, and then coming up with uh, an exercise or activity to work that area, to strengthen it. And then working with those individuals and over multiple years, that's how this, this work evolved to now we have programs for 19, you know, different cognitive functions. And I'm really clear that is a subset of what can cause learning difficulties, but it's a really broad range of, of um, challenges. And I'm very open to, uh, I've got some ideas for some more programs, um, but it was, uh, you know, again, if, if it hadn't been for the people that I worked with early on, you know, again, I'm deeply grateful because I would not have developed uh, this work without their, you know, these individuals sharing their stories and their difficulties and then being willing to work with me in kind of that experimental process. Because sometimes some of the things I developed ended up in the wastebasket because they, didn't do what I thought they did, um, which is part of the, you know, the experimental creative process. But over time, uh, you know, through working with people and refining things and developing things, 
you know, we came up with the the system that is is now used in in uh, schools and learning centers uh, around the world and is now benefiting uh, students with acquired brain injury. Uh, it, it seems to me that there would be value in, you know, testing students of all uh, skill levels at a young age to just even assess where weaknesses are. Um, is this something that the program has in mind or is it currently strictly focused on students with learning difficulties uh, that, that are more severe? Yeah, no, I, I mean, my, my vision would be to make this, um, you know, assessment process available to all, all students, absolutely. Um, and even if they chose not to do anything about it, I still think that idea of insight and understanding of, of um, you know, why something is happening, then you don't have to sort of attack yourself or criticize yourself of why am I not good at that. So to me, absolutely. And we're just developing uh, an online questionnaire. I mean, we we have one on our website currently, but we're um, uh, refining it and developing it. We're just doing a huge research project on it. So probably in another month, uh, that will be um, refined and, and available. And so someone can go into that questionnaire and either answer it for their child or someone they know or for themselves. And I think there are about almost 200 questions now. The new one might um, have a few less questions. But at the end of going through, if the person is honest about describing their areas of difficulty, at the end, it will come up with a profile saying, you know, based on your responses, it looks like these might be areas that are causing you, you difficulty. So that, you know, is a, um, an opportunity for people if, if they're interested. Um, and, and then the next step would be um, doing an assessment. And again, we are, have been put into the position of, uh, you know, our assessment has been done before in person. It's a one day assessment that looks at all the 19 uh, areas and creates a profile of strengths or weaknesses on a 12 point scale for each of those for an individual. And we're just now uh, developing uh, an online version of the actual assessment, not the questionnaire. So that hopefully maybe in, the, in a month will be available. So again, somebody anywhere in the world could go through that assessment. But I think, um, you know, my, my vision is, you know, the more we can understand about the profile, it's only really beneficial and helpful. And we have um, some initiatives that we've been doing over the last few years, what I call the whole cohort model where we um, take a, a group of students in a grade, so say grade one, uh, and we 30 minutes a day, five days a week, they do one of the cognitive exercises just in the regular class. So these are students mm. not identified as having learning difficulties because we all have a brain and we can all benefit from cognitive stimulation. Mm. Uh, and we've seen significant improvement. So we pick an exercise that's developmentally appropriate for what children are learning at that age. So in the grade one uh, studies that we've done, we've picked what I call the motor planning or motor symbol sequencing activity. And this is, um, you know, the area that, you know, translates thought into the motor plan for writing and also the motor plan for eye tracking and reading. And what we saw in, in the work that we did in the research was that students that did that 30 minutes a day compared to students in grade one that didn't do that 30 minutes a day, um, by the end of the year had improved on tests of writing proficiency, speed and accuracy by 85%. And the, the most that the students in the class is not getting the intervention were between 10 and 40%. So just for regular students, this, this is huge. Like we, we go to school to learn, we learn with our brain, so why don't we put the brain into the equation of education? Like, so mm -hmm. you go to school not only to learn, but you go to school to stimulate and enhance your brain and cognitive functioning. So we did that, that study in several schools in, in grade one and saw those results. And then, then we've done a study in Madrid in Spain in grade three, where the students uh, 30 minutes a day did the reasoning exercise, the one that I developed for myself, 
Um, and again, just regular students. And what we saw was, because uh, there was a university that was studying the, the students, and these students didn't speak English because this exercise, it doesn't matter what language, is language agnostic. Um, so the researchers you know, pre and post tested the students and they improved on executive functioning, visual spatial reasoning, uh, and attention. Um, just 30 minutes a day, five days a week, regular grade three students. So I have a whole plan, um, but in grade one, we would do the motor planning. Grade two, we would do the visual memory, symbol recognition, because students learning to read and to spell, they need to visually recognize and remember symbol patterns. Grade three, we do the, what I call quantification sense, which is critical for numeracy, mm -hmm. understanding numbers. Uh, grade four, we do the reasoning. Grade five, we do the, um, uh, uh, um, symbolic thinking, sort of executive functioning. Uh, grade six, we would probably start doing the nonverbal interpretation and awareness of, of nonverbal situations. But, you know, I, I think what would that look like? Every child in every grade would 30 minutes a day be getting, um, you know, cognitive stimulation that's developmentally appropriate. So, what it would probably mean is, you know, students that don't have learning difficulties, those functions would be enhanced and improved, which would make learning more efficient um, and actually even more enjoyable. The students that have learning difficulties would be benefiting because they would be getting that cognitive stimulation. So they may never get identified as having a learning difficulty because it's just part of regular curriculum. And so then there's no stigma, which there still is associated with having a learning difficulty today. Um, and then those individuals that I see as adults where there's just that unevenness in their profile, that would get evened out because they would be benefiting from that, that stimulation. So that that's my vision is that, you know, in every grade, students are doing um, cognitive programs that, that stimulate their, their functioning throughout, um, throughout their schooling. And then in each school, we would also have what I call a cognitive classroom where students that maybe have more challenges or difficulties could go in for part of the day because maybe they'll need more than just that one, one period. But a very fluid process that, that students would all benefit from cognitive um, enhancement or cognitive stimulation uh, throughout, you know, throughout their schooling. And I just, I think to me that's, um, you know, the future of education. I mean, certainly that's, that's my vision. And I, I put it at the end of my book when it, the first version that was published in 2012. And I thought, this is a really bold vision. This will not happen in my lifetime. And now, you know, there's a handful of schools around the world that are actually um, doing this whole cohort model in, in different ways. You know, there's a school mm -hmm. in South Carolina, there's a school in uh, outside of uh, uh, Seattle that's doing it, the, the school in several schools in, in Spain, um, uh, New Zealand, so uh, I think Australia. So I'm, I'm really excited that, you know, it's, it's, it's a very small beginning, but it's a beginning that, that, um, that I think this is where we need to go in education is, is the brain needs to be in the equation. Yes, I, I definitely agree. And while you were speaking, I was reminded of uh, an instance from your book. I'm forgetting which chapter or which exercise the students were working on, but you found that on Fridays, the boys wanted to do a specific exercise because it gave them higher scores at the arcade after yes. doing it. <laughs> There's a spatial, a spatial activity, right? <laughs> and I thought, like, why do they want to do the spatial exercise exactly on Friday? Yes, and it was, yes. I mean, I, I, I dug into that and it was it was fascinating, right? Because, it, yes, they, they were better on those, I guess, I don't know what the games were at that time, but they all had a spatial component. Um, so, so absolutely, yes. You know, and, and to me, what's so exciting, too, is, um, you know, there doesn't seem to be, you know, a, an age limit on plasticity. You know, I mean, especially as I'm getting older, it's encouraging. Um, but I think about, you know, I worked with uh, somebody who was 74 and she was a retired professor from the University of Toronto, I think in the anatomy department, and she'd never been able to recognize faces. And, it, you know, it had bothered her her whole life. And she came in and at 74 just decided, I'm going to do something about this. She worked on the 
the um, exercise and she made the same progress as, you know, 15 year old. So, um, you know, it's, it's, you know, never, never too late. And one of the new um, uh, cases in the, the 2019 version of the book, uh, which currently, sadly, is not available in North America. It's just available in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, hmm. The one of the case studies is uh, I, I think he's in his mid seventies, um, and he's he's a very successful entrepreneur. But he just found that he was getting a little um, less fast at you know being able to process information, see connections and relationships, which are really critical in negotiation. And his son had been in the program. Um, so he just asked, you know, could he do the, that reasoning activity, the one that I developed for myself? And he got up, I think, to the highest level, which I think is, you know, 10 handed clock. Uh, so it's really, there is no mm -hmm. 10 handed clock in the world, but it's processing 10 relationships simultaneously. And he talks about how that, you know, um, you know, that just sort of cognitive decline that we experience for aging has now totally reversed. And he thinks he's even stronger than he was in an area that actually was a strength for him his whole life. So, so again, um, you know, there's, there's application, you know, for our brains as we slow down, as we, we get a little older, if we, you know, want to do that, that uh, activity and, and keep our brain sharp. Absolutely. Um, and there's a, there's one case I really wanted to mention because it really, whenever I read it, it really struck me both as funny and tragic, um, tragic in the, how it, the difficulty the the person was experienced, but then kind of funny and humorous and how they, they, they evolved. And this is uh, the case of Tanya day in chapter 10. Oh. Uh, and I just want to read um, a couple lines that describe how she was talking for the audience. Um, so instead of saying, where did daddy go? She would say where daddy went. Instead of what are you doing? What do you doing? Um, and then after doing the exercises, you get to kind of see her intelligence um, after the father lets her brother and sister go over to a friend's house for sleeping to sleep over. She says, good work, dad. We're going to have a peaceful evening. And I, that just made me laugh so hard. And I wonder what does Tanya's thought process look like before she um, starts your program? How is she thinking in her mind? Is she thinking in these kind of uh, misjumbled words formations? The syntax is not quite right, or is she thinking in pictures? Do you have any sense of what that might look like? Yeah, I'm very, very disjointed. Um, you know, there was there's another um, and Tanya's one person in that chapter, and then I can't think of his name, because um, some we use pseudonyms just to protect their identity. Um, but there was a, a, a young boy that also had that same difficulty, like Tanya, and he, he talked about, you know, it's like a, you know, a pot of alphabet soup, you know, was, was, you know, cooking, and like, all the letters that made up words that made up sequences, kind of just kept Kind of shifting and moving and he so it wasn't that he couldn't recognize them but he couldn't organize them so their thought process is very dis jumbled um and and disconnected like so it's that that sequential logic right like if this then that like which we do all the time kind of cause and effect thinking um that that tanya couldn't do right so her thought process was absolutely just jumbled um like what came out her mouth um, and so the, the child that does before they think, right? So they'll um, carry out actions that are ill-considered because they can't do that, that kind of sequential, consequential thinking in their head. Like, you know how before we act, often we'll, we'll play out a scenario. We'll say, well, if I do this, this might happen, and then that might happen, and so maybe I shouldn't do this. They can't do that. So they go ahead and do this, um, which can get them into a lot of trouble, uh, because they their thinking process is is disconnected and disorganized, and not Tanya, but I've had a couple of older students that ended up um, sentenced to me by the courts with this difficulty uh, because they they couldn't do that that sequential kind of thinking and consequential thinking, and so they made some really poor decisions that got them into trouble uh, uh, legally and they their parents were aware of the work so they uh, were sentenced to my program 
And we worked on that function and they've 20 years later never had difficulty, right? Because they, they can do that, that kind of thinking. So it's, it's, yeah. So what you saw, what we saw manifest, you know, in her oral output was just a manifestation of, of her, her uh, uh, disoriented or uh, unsequenced um, thinking process, right? So really, really very significant. I call that a higher order cognitive um, function. And and she's, um, I met her again just a few years ago, all grown up and no problems with her communication or language or thinking process uh, whatsoever. And the, the young boy that I mentioned is now off in university. And again, um, no difficulties with this thinking process, but that's, you know, what, if we can understand again these cognitive functions, we can get kind of a window into somebody's, you know, process and and thinking in the world. And I'm not suggesting everybody that you know gets in trouble with the law necessarily has this problem, but there there are certain individuals that that do, um, and and it's it's because of their the the, the limitations of their 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 thinking process. Um. Yeah, that's a interesting distinction is um, the emotional difficulties or emotional trauma that someone is dealing with versus uh, a, a problem or a difficulty in cognition. Is the test enough to distinguish the two or does it require uh, more intense uh, evaluation? No, the, the, the assessment will distinguish the two. And certainly, you know, if we see that something is, is more um, personality driven or, or emotional we will absolutely find the supports, uh, you know, to uh, support the individual with those difficulties. And, and it's not to say that if somebody, you know, certainly a lot of individuals that have learning difficulties also, you know, struggle with some emotional difficulties. I mean, not always, but often like me with depression, anxiety, um, you know, and that that is not un, uncommon um, because of the, you know, the, the challenges that, that one experiences, you know, knowing that you're different, you know, seeing other people being able to do things that you struggle to do with the best will in the world. Um, so, but, and, and in those cases, their outcomes of the learning difficulty and as the learning difficulties address, um, you know, those either diminish or are more easily accessed through some good counseling or, or, mm. or therapy. I mean, I used to believe naively when I first started this work that you address the, the you know, the cognitive difficulties and then all the emotional pieces that were related to that should just disappear. Well, if you've lived with, you know, depression and anxiety for 25 years uh, and you now have the cognitive capacity, you know, that's, that's different, um, it doesn't mean that, you know, all of that, kind of emotional baggage is just going to, you know, you wake up one morning and it's gone, but you now have the resources to be able to benefit from therapy. I mean, I never would have been able to benefit from therapy with my learning difficulty because I couldn't have insight. Like, I mean, to have insight and to understand why things are happening, you have to make connections, you know, between events. And I couldn't do that. So I could have been in therapy forever with my learning difficulty and I wouldn't have gone anywhere. And we certainly see that. I mean, Norman Deutsch, who you referenced at the beginning um, of this work, uh, he's a research psychiatrist here in Toronto, where I live. And he wrote the book, The Brain That Changes Itself, and also The Brain's Way of Healing. And he got interested in my work because he saw some of his clients uh, in his practice as a psychiatrist that he felt weren't really benefiting from therapy. And he didn't feel it was resistance. You know, he, he felt there was something cognitive going on. And I have to give him a lot of credit for not, you know, saying, well, that person's just resisting. So we started up a, a dialogue and discussion and he started referring some of those clients to my work. And as they went through the reasoning uh, exercise, the one that I developed for myself, he saw at a certain point they could benefit from insight therapy, the, you know, and so, it, it, it's not just academics, these, these pieces, like, you know, that, that's fundamental to being able to have insight into, um, you know, yourself and other people and your relationship, you know, to the world and your relationship to yourself, your relationship to other people. 
So, um, you know, really very, very, very profound. I mean, our brain really mediates our relationship with the world. So if there's something there that's not working the way it's designed to, it will have some effect, you know, in, in terms of our, our relationship with, with the world. And, um, and that, you know, that, that piece of insight. So, you know, if somebody has that area, uh, you know, and goes to therapy to try to get help, there will be limited um, success with, with that mm. difficulty. Uh, yeah, the, he talks about the dark side of neuroplasticity, and at the end of your book, there's a section on that as well. Um, I wonder, like, under the use it or lose it kind of theory of how the brain works, is it possible for someone to actually learn a learning difficulty, or does it require some sort of uh, problem at birth, or in like the case of Zazetsky, uh, like a physical um, injury? Yeah, well, I, th I think um, that to learn a learning disability, I mean, there's certainly cases of deprivation, right? I mean, we, we saw that, you know, in the orphanages, uh, you know, in the, um, you know, the, a number of years ago, those children that were coming out of those, uh, you know, sort of East Bloc countries out of the orphanages, um, where significant deprivation led to um, impact in terms of cognitive functioning. Mm -hmm. uh, I think in the normal course of events, it's probably pretty hard to learn a learning disability. Um, you know, there's certainly things like learned helplessness, but usually that grows out of, there's an area of difficulty, so you avoid it. And, um, and you might even avoid it more than is necessary. Like you might find that, you know, it, it takes extra effort to do something so rather than putting that extra effort in, you'll hang back and have somebody else do it. But that's kind of just, that's a normal reaction to having, you know, a, an area that's, um, you know, significantly weak or causing challenges or difficulty in the learning process. I, I think to, I certainly haven't seen it in my work other than deprivation. I have definitely worked mm. with some of orphans that have come out of that situation. Um, uh, so, but in in the normal course of, of development, I haven't seen that one can develop a you know a learning difficulty in in that way. So it's usually it's 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 um, and we don't or certainly I don't fully understand all of what you know why these things happen. Like in my life, uh, why did I end up with the difficulties that I had? I mean, certainly there were a couple of them that. Uh, I can see like one came from my father's side of the family. So we know some of these can be inherited. Um, and one of them came from my mother's side of the family and a couple of them, I have no idea where they came from. So whether they were just, you know, new genetic combinations. Um, and if, you know, I have four brothers, so, you know, we, we could see, um, I'm the one that for whatever reason got that cognitive load, like that I kind of got, things from both sides of the family and then new new areas of difficulty that we couldn't trace uh, anywhere. Whereas my four brothers, you know, a couple of them got away unscathed and didn't have anything. And the other two maybe had one, right, which, you know, wasn't mm -hmm. that significant. And they didn't have them at the level of severity that I had. So um, it, it's just there's certainly lots of research going on to try to understand why these happen. But in a sense, for the work that I do, it almost doesn't matter like what the the source is. The program um, starts with wherever the individual is in that cognitive function, and through the the cognitive exercise, it strengthens that function, irrespective of the source. Just like we're seeing with people now with acquired brain injury, or traumatic brain injury would be who would be like the Zazetskys of the world, right? I mean, obviously, mm -hmm. it's not. A war injury, but they're coming out with, you know, car accident, stroke, aneurysm, um, you know, the impact of uh, chemotherapy or radiation. Um, and, and we're seeing that we can stimulate and enhance function. So to me, it's, it's interesting and intriguing to try to understand the, you know, the source of, of these problems, but it's not necessary for um, the, the work that we do to improve um, functioning. Yeah, that makes sense. 
Um, I guess we're nearing the end of our time here, but uh, one final question I was wondering as I read and wanted to ask you is, um, after someone has gone through this program, and maybe we can just use yourself as an example or some other case that you are familiar with, are there any residual effects um, of the learning difficulty, or is it a case where once it's addressed, it is taken care of, and then now the only residual effects might be emotional? Yeah, I, I would say the, exactly the latter, what you said. What we're seeing, I've tracked people 40 years myself out of the program, 30 years, 20 years. We don't see any drop off of function. And I believe what happens is, um, and, and we're actually doing some imaging research right now, which I can talk about really briefly. But what I believe happens is if there's um, an area of, of deficit or difficulty or challenge, it's acting as a drag on the, the neural system or the neural network um, in that it's, it's not able to really effectively engage in that neural network. Um, and the neural network is having to work harder to compensate for that difficulty. So I believe what happens is as we work on and strengthen that function, it starts to strengthen in connectivity and then be able to engage in the neural network with the other cognitive areas or cognitive functions. And then it gets its own stimulation by being engaged and working within that system rather than being a drag on the system. So it's not like, you know, exercise where if we stop going to the gym, our muscles atrophy. It, you know, it doesn't, once the student stops working on the exercises, they don't lose functionality. And I believe it's because that area is now engaged in the neural network. Hmm. Um, and what we're seeing, uh, we're doing research at Southern Illinois University, obviously in Illinois, uh, um, and at the University of British Columbia here in, in Canada. And we're looking, we're doing imaging into the brain of, of individuals going through the work. And we're also doing research with another group of researchers at the University of British Columbia in Canada with the individuals with traumatic brain injury. And we're seeing in all cases what's happening in the brain of uh, either individuals after traumatic injury or individuals with learning difficulty um, before any kind of intervention is there's a pattern that's going on in the brain where there are areas that are underconnected. The strength of connectivity is really is weak. And then there are areas of the brain that are hyperconnected. So it's, it's this idea of the brain is trying to compensate. These hyperconnected mm -hmm. areas are working really, really hard, but kind of inefficiently because they're trying to do the job of the underconnected areas. And they can't because they're not designed to do that. Uh, so we're seeing that with learning difficulties and traumatic brain injury. What we're seeing as students go through this work um, as we're imaging them is that the areas that are underconnected start to strengthen in connectivity um, and the areas that are hyperconnected can start to relax and reduce the hyperconnectivity. So a much more efficient brain. Um, and if people are interested on our website, there's a you know research document that summarizes uh, the research up to uh, um, 2019, uh, and you can go in and see the various studies that are that are being done in, in terms of uh, the the imaging. And they're also looking at you know things like working memory, auditory processing, fluid reasoning, um, and seeing all of those kind of cognitive functions are shifting in a positive direction in these individuals, uh, as well as for school age students, you know, academic um, skills. And we're seeing social emotional well being. We're seeing reduction in cortisol in these individuals. And we know cortisol is that stress hormone. So it's like the body is relaxing and there's less stress as the students are able to engage cognitively at a stronger level and the body physiologically is responding. So really, really powerful. So I encourage anybody that's interested in research, we've got lots of it um, on our website. So just go in and, and check and um, in the new version of my book, uh, the new chapter is all on the research. I'll have to get my hands on that eventually. <laughs> to see that new chapter. Yeah. Send, send me your address and I'll, I'll mail you a copy. Oh, I'd love that. Um, that'd be awesome. Uh, so I guess we're almost out of time. Do you mind if I just ask one more question? Sure. <laughs> is it your belief then? I know this obviously is total speculation, but 
do you think that the Aerosmith program could have helped uh, Zizetsky? Uh, it would have been really interesting. I think probably yes, because he still had like a, he still had some functioning. Like it, it's it's not, um, you know. I mean, if if areas are totally destroyed, then you know, it's what we believe is we're not working around. We're not, you know. Um, making other areas strong to compensate. I believe we're actually targeting that area that is is weak or not functioning properly and strengthening it. So as long as there's some functioning there, I believe we can enhance it. Um, and that's what we're seeing, uh, you know, with individuals with, um, you know, traumatic brain injury. And we're working with some individuals with quite, quite severe, uh, you know, motorcycle accidents, um, car mm-hmm. accidents, quite severe traumatic injury. And seeing, you um, significant changes. So I, I believe yes. And if people are interested in that aspect, they should just check out ABI wellness. They just Google that um, and see the fascinating work that's been done and uh, the story. So I, I think probably yes. Hmm. That's amazing. Well, thank you very much for your time, Barbara. I really My appreciate it. Yeah, this has been a pleasure. Thank you.